Good morning and happy Sabbath. I just want to welcome you to the Aurora Grande Seventh-day Adventist Church YouTube channel. My name is Pastor Joshua and I'm coming at you from the Aurora Grande Church's library. A lot of great books in here and resources for studying the Bible and making an impact on your relationship with God. So this morning I, I wanted to share a few quick announcements with you. We had our Vesper service last night again and it was absolutely phenomenal. We had a lot of people there. Uh, some people came a little early and had food. Uh, there was music. There was testimonies. And then I, I shared a little bit about what it means to be together. Um, and if you missed it, we missed you. And so we want to invite you out next week again on Friday at 6 p.m. We're going to have another Outdoor Vespers here at the church at 6 p.m. We hope you can make it. The other thing is on Wednesday nights is our Zoom call, Promises and Prayer. And we've had a lot of people come in and out and check that out. It's been great to see you guys on there for those that have come. And for those that haven't, we'd love to have you come on there and pray with you and see you on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. You can find the link in the newsletter or in your email as well. Well, we are on part four of This Is Church. And it's going to move in a little different direction today. Um, this is what I would call a foundational presentation. Uh, something that I feel like we need to ha keep at the forefront of our minds. And uh, it, has, it has everything to do with Jesus. And so I'd like to start this morning and just ask for uh, you to bow your heads as I have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you guide my thoughts and my mind and my words as I go through this um, short but impactful sermon today. And God, um, I just want to pray for all the members of the Aurora Grande Church and, their friends and, and our friends and families as well as we're uh, rising up from this uh, pandemic and we're going forward. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, there was a third grade class and the teacher asked the class, is the world round? Well, Mark quickly raised his hand and said, no. The world's not round. And the teacher, uh, shocked, said, well, then is the world flat? And then Mark quickly responded, said, no, the world's not flat either. The teacher, totally confused, said, well, Mark, if the world's not flat and the world's not round, what is the world? And Mark leaned forward and he said, you know, my dad says that the world is crooked. It's crooked. There, there's, a, there's a phrase in Peter's sermon at Pentecost in Acts 2 verse 40 that says that. It says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. It, it was a, a declaration that no one in the crowd was going to get to the kingdom unless they accepted God's offer of forgiveness and his sacrifice. Peter said, save yourselves. Now there's a few problems with that statement save yourselves. The first problem is that in the Greek, it's in what's called the passive voice. Now, Greek verbs have three voices, two of which were passive and active. And when the Greeks used the active voice, they were describing something like, for example, I hit the ball or I plowed the garden. But when they used the passive voice, they were describing an action that had been done to me or for me. For example, someone hit me or someone plowed my garden. Now, when we read save yourselves here in Acts 2 verse 40, we might think that salvation is something that we can do for ourselves, an active voice, which implies I can save myself. But it's not in the active voice in the Greek. It's in the passive. So salvation is something that's done for me or to me. Peter isn't saying that I can save myself. He's saying that someone else had to do that for me. But who could possibly save me and you? We know it's Jesus. We can only be saved by the blood of Jesus. A better translation of this verse would be to be saved from this crooked generation. And there are some translations that get that right. This verse literally means that Jesus would save them, but they had to accept his offer. In this verse, Peter was declaring that only God can save you. You can't buy your way or earn your way into heaven. 
You can't be good enough to be good enough to bribe God to get through heaven's gates to be saved. You can't do it by yourself. You know, this concept shows up a lot of places in the Bible. One place is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing, but as a gift of God, not a result of works, that no one should boast. And we read the same thing in Titus 3, 5, which says, God saved us not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You see, just the fact that we long to repent, just the fact that we long to know God is, 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 is evident that the Spirit is working on our heart and on our mind. But you know, in spite of all that, there are some people, or we slip sometimes, into the thinking that we can work our way or earn our way into heaven. In fact, it's kind of ingrained in our consciousness. We have these little sayings that declare, whatever you get, you have to pay for. For instance, you finish the, the phrase here, okay, wherever you're at in your living room or in the car, and, um, and I'll start the phrase, okay? You, you're gonna get all these right, I'm, I'm pretty sure. There's no such thing as a free lunch, right? No pain, no gain. God helps those who help themselves, right? It's part of how we think. You get what you pay for. And so people try to approach God and offer to pay to get into heaven. By good deeds, by self-righteousness, they hope they can compensate God for his kindness. The problem is when we get to heaven, those people are going to be in for a rude awakening because God doesn't want what they have to offer. Martin Luther once said, Christ never died for our good works. They were not worth dying for, but he gave himself for our sins according to the scriptures. See, there's this thing that separates us from God. It's called sin. And Jesus came to, to move that out of the way and eradicate it, throw it to the depths of the ocean. And so he paid the penalty that we were supposed to have. You know, I read a story of a young dad who decided to take his daughter out to dinner on a date. And he took his daughter out on the date, and the daughter, all she really cared about, she said, was the dessert. And she wanted to go to the store to get one of those ices, you know, the, the blue and red ones that you see at the most convenient stores. But she said, I want to pay for it, Dad. And he said, no, 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 you, you don't have to pay for it. This is me taking you out, and I'm going to pay for it. She insisted. She said, no, I'm going to bring my piggy bank. And she brought her little piggy bank in it, and I think it had about 80 cents in it. And they went out to dinner, and they had a beautiful dinner, and then they went to the little store to get the, the, the drink, and she took it up to the counter, and the dad was about to pay, and she said, no, Daddy, Daddy, I, I want to pay. And she put her piggy bank up on the counter, she dumped it out, 10, 20, 40, 50, 60, so 80 cents. The total came to 206. The clerk said, honey, you don't have enough money. All of a sudden, the dad felt a little tug on his shirt. His little seven-year-old daughter said, daddy, I think we're going to have to use your money. You know, that's the only way we're going to get into heaven. We'll only get there if we allow Jesus to pay for us. There's another problem with Peter's challenge. He said, be saved from this crooked generation. And the problem is, we don't like to think that we're in a crooked generation sometimes. Or we may think we're in a crooked generation, but we don't have any crookedness in us or in the people around us, right? Oh, there's a lot of crooked people, but I'm not crooked and neither are my friends or, or my family. But there's, there's this verse in the Bible there's quite a few, but this one I'm going to read, Romans 3, 10 through 12, that declares no one is righteous, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All turned aside together, and they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one, except for me, right? No. No, I, I'm included in there. 
I am. As much as sometimes I don't want to think that, I'm included in there, and so are you. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, We all have become like one who's unclean, and all our unrighteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. And just after Peter, cut, and just after Paul told the Ephesian Christians what wonderful people they were, he reminded them that before they were Christians, that they were dead in their trespasses and sin. And they were following after this world. And that can be found in Ephesians 2. Oh, but come on, pastor. My Uncle Fred and Aunt Martha, they're, they're not bad people. They're always so nice to us. And, and our political party? Oh, it's a great political party. They stand up for what's right. I support them. All those people are great people. You're probably laughing right now, right? We think that we're not crooked or they're not corrupt, but the Bible says they are, and so you and I, too. Now, I have a quote here I'm going to read, and I'm not sure who wrote it, um, but I'm going to read it to you. It says, You are not just lonely in need of a friend, weak in need of a helper, ignorant in need of a teacher, confused in need of a counselor, bored in need of a society. You're a sinner in need of a sacrifice. You're a sinner in need of a priest. You're sick in need of a great physician, unclean in the need of a fount for cleansing, drowning in the need of an ark. You're a sinner in need of a city of refuge. You're lost and you need a savior. That's who we are. That's you and that's me. And that's everyone else who are lost and in need of a savior. So the church, the church exists to live out and show Jesus and the gospel to the world in 2020. The church, that's you and me, exists to continually live with Jesus and the price he paid for our ransom at the forefront of our minds daily. Because let me tell you, church family, that sacrifice that Jesus made for us was so big, for lack of a better word, and so impactful, that single moment on the cross has changed you and I's eternity forever. The church exists today to share the good news that a savior can be found and people are able to be saved from a crooked generation. The church exists today to put love into action so much that it will have eternal consequences of more citizens in the kingdom of heaven. The church exists today to share the gospel. And when we put our personal agendas aside, when we put down our need to fight and always be right, and we ask for the indwelling of the Spirit, our lives become love and action, and people can see and experience Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want, I desire for my friends and my family to know Christ because he loves them more than I do. And he wants to spend eternity with them and with, them, and with you and me. And so, church family, this week I want you to reflect and think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me and how that can impact those in our community, and those in our family, and those who are our friends. Hey, you guys have a great rest of your Sabbath, and I'll see you guys next Friday at 6 p.m.